Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty and merciful God, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you in all heart. We have not loved others as our Savior Christ tells us. We are truly sorry. In your mercy, forgive us what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Almighty God, who pardons all who truly repent, forgive your sins, strengthen you by the Holy Spirit, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your grace. Glory, Glory to, to the Father, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and, and shall be forever. Amen. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. And raise a loud shout to him in songs. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the heavens of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would have hearkened to 
Let us read together the portions of Psalm 139 that are contained in our lectionary in this week. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O Lord, know it all together. You press upon me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself created my inmost parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful, and I know it are not. My body was not hidden from you, while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my hands, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your they were fashioned day by day. When I said there was none. How deep I find your thoughts, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the same. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. This first reading is 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10. Now the boy Samuel was in ministry to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days, and visions were not widespread. And at that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that the, he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. The, was. Then the Lord called Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and laid down. The Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel. Got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. My son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. On that day I will fill, fulfill against Eli all what I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the inequity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the inequity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. And Samuel lay there until morning, and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, I, here I am, Eli said. What was it that the, he told you? 
Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew up. The Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In response, let's read together the first canticle from our worship leader. O ruler of the universe, Lord your God, great deeds are they that you have done, surpassing human understanding. Your ways are ways of righteousness and truth, O King of all ages. Who can fail to do you homage, Lord, and sing the praises of your name? For you only are the Holy One. All nations will draw near and fall down before you. Because your just and holy works have been revealed. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading is from one. Corinthians 6, 12 through 20. All the things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whatever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body. But the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have, been, you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's read together the second canticle from our worship leader. Glory, Glory to God, God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit. In the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets were, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good 
come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of our Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Did you notice all the references to seeing and sight in our lessons this morning? There's Eli whose sight is growing dim with age, and maybe not just his physical sight, but his spiritual sight as well, since it took him three times to recognize God's voice calling to Samuel. Even though Paul didn't say it, I see our reading from 1 Corinthians surrounded by his anguished cries of, can't you see what is right and wrong? And in the gospel. Philip finds Nathanael, something that involves sight, and then invites Nathanael to come and see. Once upon a time, there was a homeless fellow named John, who claimed as his space the city block in front of a downtown office tower. John kept an eye on the tower, watching people come and go, and familiarizing himself with the faces of the regulars. One professional man made a deep impression on John. He was always impeccably dressed in his thousand-dollar suits, perfectly polished dress shoes, and carrying his elegant briefcase. John assumed correctly that the man worked on the top floor of that office tower. One day, John decided to ask him his burning question. As the fellow arrived at his usual time, John jumped up from his spot over the grate and stood in front of the man so he would have to stop. Excuse me, uh, excuse me. The professional man was astonished that John had stopped him and was speaking to him. Homeless people seldom spoke to him except to ask for a dollar. John continued, excuse me, I just, well, uh, I just have to know. The man stopped and looked curiously at John. Um, can you, you, can you people up there, way up there, way up on top, can you people see us way down here from up there on the street? Can you see us? You may be asking the same question of God, especially this year. Can you see us, God, from way up there? Can you really see the awful things that are happening here on earth? Can you see the terrible divisions among us, the lies, the violence, the racism, the oppression, the destruction, the riots, all the sickness that surrounds us? God, do you care? Can you see us from way up there? But we know that God is not just way up there in some lofty tower of heaven. God is also here with us, this close, mobilizing heaven and earth on our behalf. After all, that's why Jesus came to earth to be with us. God does have a preference for the poor and the oppressed. But what about those on the top floor? What happens when 
Christians become oppressors. The Reverend Martin Marty told of attending a convention where one of the presenters spoke about Southern clergy in 1861. Most clergy, it seems, were surprisingly moral and devout men, educated and caring pastors and thoughtful preachers. To a person, these devout men defended human slavery, claiming it to be a response to divine mandates and will, and authorized biblically. Well, Martin and his colleagues later agreed, that was one blind group of clergy. How could these men have been so blind? How could their sight be so dim? Then one of Martin's colleagues asked each of them to write on a piece of paper the issue that would make people a century from now ask the same question about us. How could we have been so blind? Each of Martin's colleagues wrote that we are quite blind when it comes to our own underclass, the low-level essential workers, those people who do the work you would never want to do because it's the only work they can find, those people who cannot find work, this year perhaps because of the pandemic, those people who are treated poorly in our country because of their skin color or their accent. Martin and his colleagues quickly acknowledged that they, good Christians, have blind spots, that their own sight is dim. There are times when we are the oppressed, and you know what? Those signs are pretty clear and easy for us to see. But what is so hard for us to see are the many instances in which we, albeit accidentally, assume the role of oppressor. Think of it. There's a worldwide pandemic right now that kills unpredictably. We, the rich nations, have developed vaccines. And we are, all of us, beginning to get shots in our arms for protection. But what about the people who live in poorer countries of the world who may wait years for those shots to be available before the pandemic will come to an end in their lives? What about the African Americans in our own nation who fear something as simple as driving in a car because they might get caught in a crossfire or they might be pulled over by law enforcement officials who assume African Americans don't belong wherever they are. How about those among us who cannot find work, who can't support their families, those who are homeless, even right here in Alameda County? There have been many protests this year asking us to do something monumental about all these issues. But mostly, we do not. Not really. There's lots of talk and very little action. We just don't see. Likewise, we here in the United States hear about our excessive consumption and its effect on the world. But once again, we don't do a lot about it. It's almost like seeing a great big Hummer sporting a bumper sticker with the words, save the earth. The irony that we might be the oppressors is lost on us. We just don't realize that we live at the top of the office tower that our perspective is from that great height. Do we see the little people down on the sidewalk? Our psalmist wrote about God's sight, how God sees us before we are born, how God knows us from afar, but how at the very same time God intimately knows all of our ways, our words, our thoughts. From God's perspective, that tall office tower 
is totally insignificant. It's kind of like the view of the Earth from the moon, where you can't see any borders or nations or even mountains. We do acknowledge this when we admit we are all sinners, that every single one of us is in need of God's grace. But we also forget. And that's why God's invitation to us is to come down from the tower, to mingle with the people at ground level, to be one with them, recognizing that we all fall short before God. We all need God's forgiveness. We need to remember that when one person, one of us hurts, we all hurt together. And so we pray, God, help us. Help us to see what you see, that we all are one. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son of the Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. And we shall never hope in vain. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ the Lord, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Holy and ever-living God, by your power we are created, and by your love we are redeemed. Guide and strengthen us by your Spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live each day in love to one another and to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The prayers of the people today are as follows. Call to know, love, and follow you. O oh God, we pray for the church, the world, and all needs, saying, Lord, 
in your mercy and responding. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, speak to your listening church and send it to point eagerly to the many ways in which you reveal your life-giving presence to us. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Prince, our bishop, and Carol, our priest. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator of all that is, renew the face of the earth. Heal the wounds human carelessness inflicts on creation, and rouse us to increase our care of land and waters. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the nations, restore and strengthen world leaders, especially our President Donald and our President-elect Joe. Give them a clear vision of your power to move hearts and minds, enable them to act with justice and compassion. Bring your peace to all people of this world. In your mercy, hear your prayer. God who sees all, help us to overcome our fears and prejudice, our tendency to see only our own point of view. Help us to hear those crying for justice and true peace, to stand for those who are suffering and in need instead of blaming them. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Use us to open new possibilities of life for all your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Loving God, refresh the depressed and despairing. Comfort those who weep and mourn. Give companionship to the lonely and healing to the sick, especially Matthew Cornell and Don and Sherry, to all the COVID patients, their caregivers, and both their families, and for our Shirley, who is on the mend and hopefully will be back with us soon. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Caring God, watch over those who work to keep us safe. Those in military service, first responders, highway workers, members of our police and fire departments. We pray for your blessing for essential workers who must work with the public even if the pandemic rages around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. God of all, fill our congregation with renewed zeal to love our neighbors as you love us. Open our mouths to invite friends and neighbors to come and see you. Open your eyes to see everyone from ground level, not looking down from above. Help us find ways to serve our neighbors in these difficult times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of hope, grant eternal life in you to those who have died. Bring the departed into your glorious dwelling, where all their hope will be fulfilled in your Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Trust in your love and healing, O oh God. We command to you all for whom we pray, knowing you will hear and answer. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank mm -hmm. you. 